one person awake. <laughs> Thank you. So good morning everyone and welcome to opening day on what I believe is the coldest day that we've had this season. So it's great to see everyone and I appreciate that you left room in the front for anyone who comes in late. That is fantastic. As we start this morning, I want to begin by extending um, a very warm welcome back to campus to everyone. As you probably have noticed by all of the campus announcements that have gone out, it was an incredibly busy winter break. And I just want to extend recognition and thanks to our bond team, to our facilities team, and to our IT team who did a tremendous amount of work in a very short time frame and to share with all of you that all of those major projects were completed in less time than was planned. So thank you very much. And I'll share a little bit later about some of the interesting scenarios that we faced during our, our tech-free and power-free work days as we rolled into break. I'm pleased to extend a special welcome this morning to three members of our Board of Trustees. Joining us today are Dr. Barbara George, Mr. Pat Mullen, and our Board Vice President, Mrs. Mary Strowbridge. On behalf of all of us, thank you for your service and commitment to Cuesta College. We appreciate you spending time with us. It's also my pleasure to welcome Superintendent President Emeritus Dr. Gil Stork. He assured me he's ready to present. Um, and if my math is correct, this is your 53rd year in support of Cuesta College. So thank you for your unshakable commitment to and passion for the students that we serve and for your willingness to continue to come to opening day. <laughs> As I'm sure most of you are familiar with, our restrooms are located in the lobby near the entrance of the building. And I want to make sure that you feel free to excuse yourself at your convenience. We will be taking a short break this morning, um, but you're welcome to get up as needed. In the event of an emergency, there are two vestibules located halfway through the audience, the exit doors that will take you to hallways that will eventually lead you out of the building. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, and if you've taken that route, you know it's a little less than direct. One of the real joys of gathering together this morning is the opportunity to honor excellence. And we're going to begin with our Elaine Holly Coates Service Award. The Service Excellence Award was established as an endowment account by the Cuesta College Foundation Board of Directors on May 9, 1994. It was named the Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award in January 2014 in honor of the first classified employee of Cuesta College. Ms. Coates served from July 1964 to June 1992 and represents the epitome of service excellence. Nominees must demonstrate distinguished job performance and excellence in service beyond normal job expectations. The nominating comments this year for our award recipient included, without a doubt, this person is the single most devoted, effective support staff colleague I have ever known. It is how and the extra care with which they accomplish their work that warrants the recognition of true service excellence. Their selfless dedication, strong work ethic, and commitment to student success warrant the full recognition of this award. They provide invaluable help to students with regard to calculations, conceptual questions, and technical problems. Labs are always prepared correctly and on time, even if they are not on campus the day of the lab. 
They work routinely and closely with instructors, going above and beyond to ensure field sites are accessible when needed. And finally, they provide support for labs that facilitate critical hands-on learning for physics, physical science, geology, and oceanography at all Cuesta class locations and for dual enrollment. This year's recipient is Physical Science Division Lab Technician, Mark Sparlin. appreciate your service. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roland Finger, Professor of English and President of the Academic Senate Council to present our next award. Okay. The next award is the Peter and Mame Diffley um, Academic Excellence Award. Um, Peter originally made this award to memorialize his wife, Mame, who had passed away. Um, and the award requires great teaching, but something extra, um, a heavy dose of involvement in campus and community life. This year's winner deals with more red tape than most faculty can probably fathom. She cuts through it like a scalpel. The winner prescribes rounds of outreach activities for herself, assisting those who want to enter a profession that deals with terrifying afflictions of the human frame, death, parasites infections. She leads faculty in a discipline that has its very own popular Halloween costume. It's unfortunate that that costume reflects gender stereotypes, but this is something that we as educators can keep on working on. <laughs> Last but not least, this year's winner is a Hello Kitty enthusiast because this charming character can make the study of anything a little more bright and fun. Hello Kitty is better than pharmaceuticals. <laughs> the Peter M. M. A. Diffley Award winner this year is the Chair of Nursing, Monica Mollard. His husband, Brian, also has a Halloween costume. Congratulations. I don't know what to say. I'm completely shocked. <laughs> um, I actually just told Anne there must be another Hello Kitty fan out there. <laughs> 
I never would have thought it would have been me. So thank you so much. For, I'm just completely honored. And just, I just can't, I have no words. Thank you so much. And my family, I thought they were going to school this morning. Um, she's supposed to be at school this morning. Um, and interestingly enough, I always take my daughter to school. And this morning, last night, Brian said, I'll take her to school in the morning so you can be on time to the meeting. <laughs> Never knowing that this was, that they were going to be here. This is my daughter, Ariana, and my husband, Brian. Thank you so much. And thank you all for this. Thank you. Thank you, Roland, and congratulations, Professor Millard. Under the leadership of Associate Director of Marketing and Communications, Richie Bermudez, the Marketing and Media team has created this video introduction of the newest members of the Cuesta College community. Oh, hopefully I can get there. I'm Megan Boaz Alvarez and I'm adjunct faculty in the psychology department. Hello, my name is Margaret Carter and I'm a part-time faculty member of the Emeritus Program. Hello, my name is Lori Norris Cooper and I am a part-time faculty in the Emeritus Program. My name is Jane Kerr and I'll be teaching yoga at the Senior Center in Paso Robles for North County Cuesta College. Tara Davis, instructor for Part-time employability skills, non-credit. Zachary Dock, Department of Music, Applied Piano. I'm Ronnie DeCamp, and I'm one of the new LVN clinical instructors. I'm Jeremy Edmonds, uh, instructor for the manufacturing program. Alyssa Espinola, communication studies instructor. Angelica Yoki, counselor for the CAFE program. My name is Garrett Forbes. I'm a part-time instructor in the agriculture business department. Karen Franklin, non-credit, CTE, computer basics instructor. Hello, I'm Marta Herrera and I'm part-time faculty for the nursing program. Hello, my name is Janice Johnson. I am the music department piano accompanist. Uh, Rachel Kovac, non-credit career technical instructor. I'm Justine Nevs, part-time lecturer, architecture. Hi, Marshall Otwell, Applied Music Instructor. I'm Rachel Pass, and I'll be teaching in the College Success Studies Department. I'm Christine Reddy, and I am an Agriculture Business Teacher. Hi, my name is Isabel Saber, and I'm the Interim Dean of Math and Sciences. I'm Logan Sanders, and I'm the Aquatics Lead for Community Programs. My name is Spencer Schultz, and I'll be a part-time Chemistry Faculty in the Physical Sciences Department. Anna Smith, part-time faculty, Allied Health. Brian Wampler, part-time automotive technology instructor. Hi, my name is Veronica West and I am working part-time with the counseling department. I'm Taylor White, I'm an instructional aide and I work in the Student Success Center. Henry Wintergerst, lab technician, automotive department. Hello, my name is Rolando Zapata. I'm the academic advisor for DSPS. Hello, my name is Preston Federico, a general maintenance worker with facility services. Frazier, plumbing. Hi, my name is Bob Jocelyn. I'm Director of Facilities, Services, Planning, and Capital Projects. I'm Tony Uvaldi, and I'll be a computer technician. Hi, my name is Judith Gonzalez, and I'm the Enrollment Success Specialist. I'm Rebecca Hart. 
um, Counseling Assistant in Student Services. Hi, I'm Genevieve Siwabesi. I'm the Dean of Student Services. Hi, I'm Michelle Hanafie. I'm the Director of Philanthropy with the Foundation. Hi, I'm Bonnie Morris, Foundation Programs Coordinator. So welcome everyone and it's a great opportunity to get to meet our newest employees and members of the Cuesta College family. Now we want to take some just a few minutes to celebrate some of the milestones that you may have achieved in your own personal family and I'm going to, um, these are just stock photos and I could not find a baby as cute as the ones that this campus has been having. Um, <laughs> I have no worries about our enrollment in 18 years, right? We, we are doing great work in that area. Um, is Rick Camarillo here? Rick has two major milestones. Are you ready to share, Rick? I can't see him. All right, I'm not seeing Rick. Does someone else have a milestone? And we'll let him share another day. <laughs> oh, I've seen some beautiful baby pictures. No one wants to share? Yeah, all right. Well, moving right along. <laughs> It doesn't seem that anyone had a very productive fall or, or holiday break. You bought a house? Congratulations, Susan. It's a huge milestone. Yay. Especially in San Luis Obispo County, right? Absolutely worth celebrating. Congratulations, Dan. As long as that helps us see positive numbers, we are good. We are good. So I mentioned that we had some time over um, as we were heading into winter break where we had some work days that looked different than they normally do. We had some days without technology and some days without power, and sometimes we were left wondering, well, is the power supposed to be off today or, or is this something I need to report? Um, but it really provided a great opportunity across the campus for us to dig in and um, I think unburden ourselves with, with some of the documents that we have kept. I'm not sure that our buildings are quite as earthquake proof as they might have been before we unloaded some of that paper. But I found some real treasures in the, in the president's office and I'm just gonna share a couple of them today. One of them that I found is the 1967-68 student handbook. That was mine, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's only seven pages long, which was pretty amazing. And one of those pages listed all of the employees of the college. <laughs> and, um, but it, under the heading, How Dressy is Cuesta? This is one of the quotes. <laughs> that was interesting. And, and co-eds were encouraged to wear wool or cotton dresses or skirts. Um, and I thought it was very unfair because the gentlemen were welcome to wear Levi's. Um, but it specifically said no shorts, pedal pushers, or pants for women. So we've come a long way. <laughs> I also found the faculty manual from 1965-66. And what was amazing to me, it was 77 pages, so, so pretty lengthy. Included a job description, I think, for every job on campus, which was, which was really interesting. But I found this little bit that made me see that really distance education at Cuesta College was rooted in the beginning. Um, and we had an educational television department and this specific statement that that was to be included in, in the curriculum. And so to think that 
Um, what we do today in terms of DE really reflects our earliest beginnings, I thought was really interesting and fascinating. And I also found stacks and stacks of documents that relate to our history of planning. And it was very interesting to look and review some of those as we have um, spent fall really preparing and bringing through the governance process the strategic plan that leads us through 2023. So this is a screenshot that comes directly out of the integrated planning manual found on page four that shows where our strategic plan fits within all of the planning that we do at Cuesta College. And on top of all of it, of course, is our mission. And then we always have data analysis, but we have two very long-term, actually at Cuesta College, 10-year plans that are our long-term planning that are foundational for everything else we do. And it's our education master plan and our facilities master plan. The strategic plan is a shorter term, a three-year plan that really drives us to meeting those institutional goals that are set forth in our long-term plans. And it was the strategic plan that we were working on this time. And the strategic plan is supported by our operational plans and by our institutional program and planning, or IPPR processes. And so I thought it was important for us to remind ourselves where the strategic plan fits. Um, one of the things that was a kind of a recurrent theme as the strategic plan revision was going through the process was this interest in really building it out and having it mu be much more robust and including all of the how. And I think it's important for us to remind ourselves that we have operational plans that are laying out the how. And our operational plans um, include our student equity and achievement plan. It includes our outreach plan. It's our um, technology plan. And it's our unit plans as well. So our integrated planning also has a very intensive timeline that looks like this. And I realize that you can't see it. But I wanted you to get some sense of the detail. And again, this comes out of the integrated planning manual that really lays out almost month by month exactly what we should be doing to maintain the plans that we have at Cuesta College. So this is what it looks like, and this is what it feels like. We are seem to always be right up against a deadline for making sure that we have the robust kind of opportunity to have dialogue around our planning and what is coming forward. As we were looking um, and preparing to do our strategic plan update, it was also a great opportunity and time for the mission statement to be reviewed. Now this actually happened in 2018-19 and went to the Board of Trustees in June where they approved or reaffirmed the mission statement that Cuesta had previously adopted. There were no changes to the mission statement, but we engaged in the process of review to ensure that in light of all the changes that we've had at the state level, our mission statement still reflected the priorities that we have been handed, aligned with accreditation standards, and really tells the story of why we are here and what we are committed to do in service to our community. So in wrapping up and completing the work laid out in our 2017-2020 strategic plan, the 2019 progress report went to the Board of Trustees in September and it really um, provided an overview of all of the work that had been accomplished in meeting the institutional goals laid out. And in planning for this strategic plan, it really provided an opportunity to look at all of the new things that we have been asked to complete, legislated to complete, the new pressures and influences on our institution from a state level. And all of these things, I am sure, are familiar to you. We feel all of them differently, depending upon our role at the college. And as I look at this, it seems to me the obvious thing that we would think really would influence our strategic planning would be the student-centered funding formula. 
because it really has caused us to rethink ways to maximize our opportunity to earn um, apportionment and resources for the college. But the reality is the big game changer in terms of our strategic and long-term planning is the vision for success. Now, Chancellor Oakley set this out in July of 2017 in a very large document called Vision for Success, and it's a comprehensive plan to improve community college service for Californians. And since that time, two major memos have been sent to colleges providing guidance for how we are to implement the vision for success at each of the 114, 115, depending upon where you stand. So here are some key points that come from a memo that was sent in 2018. And part of this really is exciting because it's the opportunity for us, all of the colleges, to use a single set of metrics and to um, ensure that we are, are consistent in, in our measurement of what we are looking at. In particular, it sets out that each metric will be valid, drillable, measurable, and critical. The next memo, guidance memo, provided some extended direction in terms of what we were to do with this. And this came when we were um, given our deadline for adopting local college vision goals in alignment with the vision for success. And so there are three particular statements that I'm sharing that came from this memorandum called Coherence in Goal Setting and Planning from February 13th of 2019. And it says colleges should consider using these goals for the basis of planning they will be developing concurrently or subsequently. Now, I appreciate that this has subsequently, because initially the chancellor's intent was that every college was going to relaunch their planning around vision for success immediately, rather than following the long-term and strategic plans that were already in place at institutions. So that was important that we had this now opportunity for subsequently. There was the emphasis that there was a new focus on the alignment of our college plans with the vision performance goals. And then this quote at the end, too many plans can confuse priorities. So strong encouragement that colleges align planning with the local vision goals. So as we set out to update our strategic plan, um, which was approved at College Council in November and then presented to the Board of Trustees in December, we really had an obligation as well as opportunity to start to align our institutional goals with what has been set forth in the vision for success and with the state system requirements and expectations. And so, Here's a crosswalk of what our previous strategic goals look like, or um, institutional goals, and the new goals in the 2020-2023 plan. So there are four goals that carry across, and those are important. So completion, access, facilities and technology, and fiscal. Partnerships disappeared. And partnerships did not go away because it's not important. As a matter of fact, it is valid and it is critical in terms of those measures that we were given by the Chancellor's Office, but it's not drillable or measurable. And measuring partnerships is something that's very squishy and hard to do, and most colleges do it by, um, by counting evidence of relationships, things like students, um, and internships. It's the number of um, university transfer agreements. It's things that aren't necessarily concrete um, and would not necessarily change year from year in a way where you could show growth in that area. So partnerships absolutely is institutionalized in the way we work 
And we can see evidence of that in our joint grants that we have with, with Cal Poly, the way we work with Allen Hancock College in a variety of areas, our great connections with um, San Luis County Office of Education and the local school districts, and the way that we partner with more community organizations than we can mention. And we are working on a way to try to be able to capture what we are really doing across the campus to be able to reflect and share with our community what exactly that looks like. And so more to come on that. But added to the goals is transfer unit accumulation and workforce, which are specifically spelled out and required in the local college vision goals. So in the 2020-23 plan, our institutional goal number one is access. And here are the measures that we are going to be following to ensure that we are providing access. And one of the things that I think we really need to celebrate today is the access that we are now providing at CMC. This spring, we will be holding two commencement ceremonies um, at the facility um, and awarding associate degrees. And And I've already received one letter from a, from a degree completer who's actually working on his second associate degree with us and really sharing the difference that this is making for him. And so that is huge. But we still have um, pockets of our community that do not have necessarily yet the kind of access that would facilitate their opportunity to attend at Cuesta. And so we will be measuring and continuing to measure access. Completion, this is our really big goal. This is the end game and it's why we are all here. When we convened in August, we looked at um, completion as a percentage and using the metric that had previously been in the scorecard, which was how we reported out previously around some state monitored metrics. So up here is the national completion rate um, in 2018 and 2019, we looked at the California Community College aggregate completion rate and then Cuestas. And we were excited, yay, that we are above, but also recognized that we want better than half of our students to complete timely. As in our new metrics, the measurement is changing a bit to align with the local college vision goals. And I would just remind everyone that this is where we have been handed a target in the Chancellor's vision for success, and that target is absolutely a stretch goal. It is intended to be nearly impossible for us to reach. And that goal is an increase of 20% from 2016-17 to 21-22. And so we have big, big work still to be done in this area around completion, and you are doing it every day. Transfer. This is a new goal, um, and it comes directly from the vision for success. And even a bigger challenge here, when we are directed to aim for a 35% increase. And in particular, the challenge for Cuesta without a local CSU um, guaranteed transfer institution is that this is specifically targeting CSU and UC transfer, which is certainly easier from some community colleges than others, depending upon um, their proximity to a CSU that has guaranteed transfer agreements. Um, I will say I'm excited about some of the things that are happening around transfer. We do have a CSU partner that we are close to being able to announce. Um, I'll tell you the details. It's the details that are, that are keeping us from being able, being able to announce in a timely fashion, but we are very, very close and it is going to be life-changing for some of our students. And the second thing is I want to just share how pleased I am with the conversations with Jeff Armstrong and his team at Cal Poly and the way that um, 
I am being provided opportunity to weigh in around transfer and the importance of transfer and to, I hope, have some influence as they are bringing back summer admits. And I have said, that needs to be focused on transfer. That is a great opportunity for a successful community college student to enter Cal Poly. And they have been open to hearing that. Um, it's going to be limited to some specific programs. They are still working to design it. Students would necessarily have to attend summer the whole time they're there. <laughs> and maybe they would have winter or spring or fall as their off term. But they're seeing it as a way um, not only to increase transfer opportunity, but also to, um, to overcome some of the challenges they have with um, running out of physical space. And so we're going to stay tuned there. But I am pleased that um, my, my encouraging that they think about transfer in that light seems to be aligning with um, addressing some of the challenges they saw in how do you onboard new students in the summer when we don't have the full scale of our um, support services on board. Unit accumulation. This is a new measure. And looking at the number of units that our students who complete a degree or certificate or transfer, how many units they have when they leave. And the goal is to drive that down. The target handed to all community colleges is 79. So for us, that's a 9% decrease as our 16-17 unit accumulation average was 87. The good news is 87 um, while it might seem high, is actually considerably lower than some of our sister colleges. And um, we are going to be assisted with, by AB 705 in this area for sure. Changing that um, pathway to transfer level math and English is going to help drive us toward this, this goal of 79. Also new is workforce. And measuring workforce success is always a challenge. Um, and so you see that they haven't even given us any target data. <laughs> if you've been in community colleges for a while, you know that um, we've had a number of system chancellors who have really um, said that part of what they're going to do is help us connect with EDD and work workforce data so that we can better understand where our students are going and what they are doing after they enter the workforce. And yet, that still has not come to fruition. But the real goal here is to increase the median earnings of students and to increase the proportion of students who attain the regional living wage. And so it's really about income. Part of what they continue to try to measure is students who are working within their field of study. This is really a challenge because workforce data and field of study don't always fit together very well. When someone, um, welding seems to be the example I always go to, but someone trains and they become certified and they go to work as a welder, but if they go to work for a um, public utility, they're not gonna show up as a welder and under the EDD data. So, th so there's a disconnect. If they go to work for a dairy, they're not gonna show up as a welder. And so even though their, their job may be welding, it's hard to be able to track that accurately. So I remain hopeful that someday we're gonna be able to have a better sense of whether our students are entering fields related to their um, area of study, but it is imperfect at best at this time. So in terms of that measure being um, imperfect, the goal is that 75% of our students in our career technical education programs would land in a closely related field. Um, we are currently at 69%, and that is a number that there's quite a bit of fluctuation year to year, again, because the data is not, um, is not consistent. So a goal that carries with us around facilities and technology, the opportunity that, to ensure that, especially around our Measure L projects, that we are um, 
keeping our eye on the prize of making sure that our improvements support the teaching and learning for today and tomorrow. And finally, our fiscal goal. And we've added considerable number of measures here, and it reflects um, some of the metrics in the student-centered funding formula, and I've used some colors so you can kind of see how they're grouped together. The first three are around enrollment. Um, the fourth bullet is really around the socioeconomically challenged student, the one who is eligible for federal and state financial aid. We're also looking for the ways that revenue comes into our college outside of enrollment, um, our interest, and then always maintaining a focus on having a balanced budget and um, reasonable levels of reserve in accordance with our board policies. So our big goal remains completion, and I love this photo. This is from our 2019 graduation, and I love that you can't find an unhappy face in this whole sea of graduates. And um, the hat even says, sweet victory. So as we are focused toward completion, one of the things that there has been quite a bit of discussion and whatabouts raised is auto awarding of degrees and certificates. And this is an area where the cabinet has been doing quite a bit of work. And we had some guiding principles as we engaged in this work. And the first is do no harm. And we set out first to identify students who ha could potentially be harmed by this switch of process um, that would auto award them. We know who those students are. Those students are our CalWORK students and our veterans. And so we are building processes to protect those students to ensure that any auto awarding um, would exclude them so that there is no opportunity for them to, their, um, their financial support to be in jeopardy. We wanted to strategize to maximize the impact of this move toward auto awarding of degrees and certificates. And we want to ensure that the policy, the process, the publication is all updated. And um, it's very interesting when you start looking for information, we found we were really inconsistent in the terms we used. We found that we had it published all over the place in hard copy and on the web in lots of different places. So it took quite a bit of investigating to even find where this information was all housed. And we want to launch with clear communication, including an opt-out for students. And to make that, make that easy and accessible. So where are we? We anticipate that we will auto-award certificates um, next year in 2021. And we will start to auto-award degrees in 21-22. And Again, it's making sure that we have clear communication, that everyone knows where we're moving. We are maximizing the impact in terms of the, when we would roll out of Hold Harmless and the SCFF, and to make sure that we have all of the um, process in place uh, that we can do this effectively and efficiently moving forward. So lots and lots of departments have already been engaged and involved in this. Um, and so work is happening in this arena. Some test runs have already been done, even as far back as last spring. Technology is not the, the challenge. The technology exists. It's about the, the process, the procedure, and the communication that we need to all be um, clear around, and then ensuring that we have that safe harbor for students who have the potential to be harmed. And with that, I'm going to invite our Vice President of Administrative Services, Dan Joy, forward. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Well, you're, I can say from up here, I can see you all very well because the lights are on. And what a handsome audience you are. I can see you all got your hair cuts and all that over the break. Uh, Bill, I, I usually judge the length of how far are we into the turn by Bill Demarest's hair. The shaggier he gets, I know the closer we are to completion. He's looking good today, though. Um, so the, the other thing I'd ask you to, to ponder 
while we're while we have while I'm up here today is whether or not I am the worst singer to ever set foot on this stage. Yeah, what do you think? I'm in the conversation, okay? I'm totally, totally in the conversation. Good. So uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about the student-centered funding formula, uh, just so the I think the broad we talk a lot about this in planning and budget committee and other venues, but I know the broader campus doesn't always have an opportunity to uh, to hear what's going on. So I thought this was a great opportunity to share some of that with you today. Uh, so where are we now? So if you missed the first season uh, of SCFF, um, it was uh, it had its first year of implementation in the 2018-19 uh, year. Uh, and you may remember that the state at that time approved three years of Hold Harmless. So if you were uh, a losing district in the formula, and you can raise your hand if you're a losing district in the formula. We, yes, good, you, you know that we are. Um, the, what the Hold Harmless did was it took your prior year revenues, the 17, 18 year revenues, and it gave you, uh, funded you at that level with the COLAs for the subsequent year. So we're not yet feeling the negative impact of the SCFF, we're still in the Hold Harmless and that was scheduled initially to go for three years. Uh, in the 2019 approved budget, they added a fourth year of hold harmless to that, okay? So what that means, yeah, that's, that's good, but if they make it 30 or so, I'm like, if they could push it out to my retirement, is what I'm, <laughs> is what I'm hoping. Um, uh, so that would, as, as in current law, that would put us out through the 21-22 through the year, we'd be in hold harmless, and in 22-23, then we would be subject to the formula, at least that's how the, the law works today. Uh, so as you may or may not know, uh, there were major, major problems with the implementation of the formula. Uh, why were there major problems with the formula? Because they rushed to implement it, right? It was, re it was, uh, it was proposed in, the January, in January of 2018, it was law by, uh, by the final budget in June that year. That's not a lot of time to assess the impacts of the data uh, that they put into that formula, right? So uh, when you put in, so when uh, a lot of the metrics that they use in the formula are reported through MIS, they've never been, uh, it's never triggered funding before, right? It has never been audited to make sure that everybody was doing, interpreting things the same way, reporting accurately and all that. So what do you think happened uh, when they did tie a lot of those metrics to funding? Do you think those numbers that districts reported went down? Or did they go up? Yes, you guessed that, right. Uh, they, they went up, right? So uh, what happened in 2018, as in that first year of implementation, uh, it, it turns out that the state was short of fully funding the, uh, the formula as they had estimated they would based on old metrics, right? So uh, what the state did was that they, um, for, for the winners in the formula, they held you to a maximum gain of just a little bit over 8%. So what does that mean? That means if you thought your district was gonna get 12% uh, increase, say, um, you got halfway through the year and they said, did we say 12? We're gonna have to pull some of that back. Uh, so as you can imagine, that, uh, that created a lot of consternation across campuses. In fact, when I, um, I was in Sacramento just this week for a budget workshop, and uh, I, I find that districts are really um, pitted against each other now in ways I haven't seen in my, in my history in, in the system so far. It, it's very sad because you have districts who are winners who felt like they deserve this money, the formula is supposed to reward them this money. They're actually resentful of districts like us who are in whole harmless because they feel like we're, uh, you know, we're, uh, we don't deserve the money. You know, the formula awards them that, those figures and they feel like that we should be just taking our lumps, uh, losing that money right away so they can realize the gains that uh, you know, the good Lord bestowed upon them. Um, so, um, it, it's a very uncomfortable time in Sacramento right now for these reasons. Um, so, what the Chancellor's Office is pledged to do is that they are going to recalculate all the rates in the formula that will be, uh, 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 you know, within the constraints of the funding revenue. So, they'll, kind of re they'll reduce where appropriate the rates uh, they need to do to match the revenues. That is going to happen later this spring, probably February. But right now I think it's very interesting to note that we're in year two of a funding formula and nobody knows what the rates are. <laughs> Sacramento. So uh, where are we now? Right now the, the committee, there's a committee, uh, legislative oversight committee has been uh, approved in statute and appointed by uh, uh, the governor and the assembly and the senate get to appoint members to this committee who are tasked with 
um, uh, uh, ass assessing certain potential changes uh, that could be made to the formula. Um, so it's a, it's a diverse group of, of stakeholders. It has faculty, it has administrators, it has students, it has uh, classified staff, public advocates and all that. They're all, they're all, all, the, all the wise uh, stakeholders within the groups that have been gathered to provide their input into this. And they are charged with producing two reports, uh, the first of which just came out uh, late last month and the second which will come out later next year. So let's talk a little bit about what these uh, initial recommendations are. So uh, first thing that the oversight committee is doing is recommending adding first generation students into the formula. So first generation students are defined as students for whom neither parent has a college degree. Uh, so uh, the, the committee is recommending that they um, that be added to the supplemental formula. So just like a college gets uh, points for having a student who's a Pell Grant student, you get points for having a student who's first generation. Uh, and also in the success part of the formula, if, uh, if a first generation student is awarded, is successful, is awarded a degree or certificate, you would get extra uh, funding for that too. Again, similar to how, say, Pell Grant students are treated. Uh, so right now, uh, there's, a, there's some data issues with that. I, I was talking to Ryan Carnell about this. He's a bigger expert on this than I am. Uh, that the only way we collect that data right now is through CCC Apply. So students self-report it. I think there's some issues about whether that's a reliable way to measure it. So um, the, the governor and the stakeholders are recommending that, you, that they spend about a year developing that data to make sure it's a, it's, it's a little bit more sound and how it's produced. Uh, the committee was asked to uh, recommend considering academic proficiency of incoming students. Uh, they decided not to recommend uh, inclusion of that. And the rationale is that, again, the data, it's, they found it hard to consistently judge what that standard would be, so they're not recommending that uh, at this time. There was a big discussion about having a regional cost of living uh, adjustment in the formula. So you can imagine, when we talk about needy students, uh, the, the threshold for being needy might be a little bit different in Avenel than it is in Los Gatos, right? Uh, it takes a lot more money to, uh, to support yourself in Los Gatos than it does uh, in Avenel. Uh, so for obviously right now, the formula is gonna uh, reward uh, a community like Avenel a lot more than it is a community like Los Gatos. So there was a discussion about whether there should be some kind of regional adjustment to account for that. Uh, the committee deadlocked on it. There was literally a six to six vote. Uh, no, no recommendation on that. So as you can, I think you can see, it's kind of easy to see both sides of the argument of that, right? It's, it's it, those students who are needy in, uh, there are needy students in Los Gatos who are not being supported right now in those districts in high cost areas like ours, like uh, the South Bay districts, uh, are losing a lot of funds in the formula. And uh, they're going to find it hard to have those extra support funds to help those students who are needy. On the other hand, it's also hard to imagine that the legislature, by putting in uh, supplemental factors, imagine shifting funds from Avenel to Los Gatos in that formula. So uh, anyway, I think they're, they're hoping for, to have further study on that. And with that in mind, they also recommend adding a fifth year of Hold Harmless. And, and I think the big point of that is to is to be able to have a little time to assess the negative impacts of the formula, to understand why uh, districts that are losers in, in the formula, uh, if there are reasonable adjustments that could be made, and, it, and, and that it takes a little bit of time to assess those, uh, those factors. So that's what uh, the intent there is. And of course, the last recommendation, which is a genius recommendation in my view, is to fully fund the formula. Wouldn't that be a good idea? So. Um, the committee's uh, next year's task with a couple of other things. They'll be looking at instructional service agreements. Uh, right now, uh, those ISA programs, similar to our Atascadero State Hospital program, are not in the formula at all. They're just funded as if uh, they're FTS uh, in, in, the, in the old formula. And also look at ways of including um, uh, non-credit instruction. The other thing they'll be doing is taking is trying to assess how do we handle the formula in the event of a recession, right? What, what is our strategy? Uh, when funds start going negative, how do you, how do you uh, allocate or reduce district funds with that? Uh, under the old system, what we did, if there was a, a deficit, is that it was done across the board, right? So if we were 
uh, the state was 2% short of funding, every district would get a 2% cut, right? And the reason why that made sense, uh, in my view, was that we were equally funded, right? We were all getting roughly the same amount of uh, funding per FTS. So there was really not much of a rationale to do anything different other than it across the board. Uh, I and some others are arguing, going forward, if we have disequalized funding, if some districts are getting 6,000 per FDS and some are getting 9,000 per FDS, is it fair to treat us all the same in that kind of reduction, right? I think there's a real risk that those low-funded districts uh, are going to find it hard to even fund a classroom if they're forced to cut anymore. So um, I hope that that will be considered in those discussions. What else is happening? You'll notice a lot of blank space here. Uh, that, is, that is intentional. Um, so again, the, the governor's not proposing any immediate changes to the formula. Uh, he did signal a willingness to take a look at the, uh, the first gen adding the first generation uh, students to the formula, but they want to spend a couple of years. Let's get the data right. Let's spend a couple of years uh, testing it. I think that makes sense. Um, and it's a fairly quiet, frankly, budget for the community colleges as a whole. Uh, Dr. Stearns uh, this morning mentioned referenced a lot of the major initiatives we've been working on, right? SAFF, Guided Pathways, AB705, Strong Workforce. I mean, all these major initiatives have been uh, shoved onto the community colleges over the last few years. It's created a lot of work, a lot of turmoil on campus. And I think what we're seeing here is it's a kind of a pause year for major initiatives. I think they want things to settle down a little bit before they try to, uh, to uh, uh, get creative again. Uh, with us, so I, I, I for one welcome a bit of a pause in that regard. Uh, so opportunities, what can we do in the formula? I mean, this is really, um, it's really a campus-wide effort, right? It's not, it's not, uh, I'm the money guy, but it's not a fiscal uh, effort, right? I mean, all these, all these things that benefit us in the formula happen all across the campus. They happen in Mark Sanchez's area, they happen in Jason Curtis's area, they happen all across the campus. I think all of us in some ways can play a part in uh, approving our standing in the formula. So Dr. Stearns referenced this morning in her, uh, in her introductory comments, the auto awarding of degrees, obviously ticking up the number of degrees, ticks up uh, the revenue in the formula. A lot of other colleges have already done that. Uh, that's why they look good in the formula. So you know we, uh, should, we need to be adjusting to that reality too, that counting the most awards that we can rightfully count uh, is certainly in our interest. Uh, Later on today, you'll hear about guided pathways. That should help increase uh, our success metrics as well. So I'll let uh, Madeline uh, talk about that. Uh, Mark Sanchez has talked a lot about his expanded outreach efforts. I know we're doing a lot more in terms of uh, promoting our materials and uh, bilingual uh, 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 materials and all that. So I, that, that is a, a getting in that FTS, finding those pockets of students who can benefit from the instruction we provide. Uh, has, has always been important. It's especially important today. Uh, alternative revenues. Uh, so uh, Jill made a reference to this as well uh, in terms of our uh, strategic uh, plan. Uh, we have property, uh, particularly in North County, that I think is, uh, uh, has potential for us to lease out and, and, and achieve revenue from that. I think particularly the Kesick property. Uh, you may or may not know what that is. It's about 23 acres uh, across uh, the, from Buena Vista Drive in the North County campus. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that we'll have any need to develop that property in the next several decades for, for our uses given our enrollment trends. Uh, we have plenty of land up in North County otherwise. Uh, so I think there's a real potential for us to develop uh, a lease option for that that would generate a revenue uh, for the district. So obviously that's not a short-term goal that will take several years before we really realize any revenue from that, but that's something that we'll be exploring. Um, another issue I thought it would be worth just broaching uh, a bit today is um, the basic aid status. I get asked this question a lot, when are we going to be basic aid? Uh, so as, um, if, as we're squeezed in the formula, right, the threshold for us to achieve basic aid gets lower, right, because the revenue we're getting from the state is not growing as fast as the local property tax is. So when the state lowers our funding, we get closer to that that uh, that point. Uh, so I think that's 
good news for us, I think, as we go forward, because that creates uh, a floor for us, right? As, as poorly as we do in the formula going forward, we can only drop so far, right? Because we do have those local revenues that support the district. Uh, right now, we're about uh, our property tax and fees, which accounts for our local revenue, is roughly 90% of our apportionment funding. So I think, you know, if I want to provide some, I don't usually provide comfort because I'm the fiscal guy. I usually try to scare you about this one. That's what I do. I, I think I do a pretty good job. Um, uh, but, you know, I also want to provide some assurance that there's only so far we, uh, we can drop. We're not going to lose half our funding. We that, you know, we, with the property tax shoring us up, we have that as a, as a backdrop. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, one of the other ways, of course, that we'll be uh, looking to improve our standing in the formula is through enrollment <coughs> management. And uh, with that, I'm going to bring up Dr. Jason Curtis, who will talk about that. So thank you all. I look forward to chatting with you for lunch. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I love being up on this stage. Did you hear that, Brie? I like being up on this stage. Um, so, Dr. Stearns encouraged the, the VPs and, uh, to be fun and engaging while we were up here during our time today. So, we've had a, we've had a strategic plan, that's fun. And we had a student-centered funding formula, which is just oodles of fun. And in trying to think about what I was going to do, um, I decided, well, you know what? I'm an interim. Let's take some risks. So we're going to do something, and it's either going to be really fun and memorable, or it's going to be a complete train wreck and still memorable. So we'll give the, the screen a chance to switch over here. Maybe. This is memorable. Yeah, so far so good. <laughs> it's okay, I know how to make it work. If I have to break the presentation, I will. Seems promising. <laughs> All right. We wouldn't normally encourage this, but please take out your devices. Open a browser. Navigate to kahoot.it or kahoot.it. I'll give us all plenty of time here. And you'll have to enter that pin to join our opening day game. Oh yes, and your, your name will appear on the screen. And should you end up winning or being in the top three, your name will really appear on the screen. So be prepared to own it. Yeah, I saw my name, that's good. Someone's grabbing my phone. We also have new Wi-Fi in the CPAC. So this is a good stress test of that. You're welcome, Keith. Really, I'm just filling my time with the Kahoot lobby ninja. I thought about whether to do this as a post-test or a pre-test. Post-test is really not very fun. Pre-test, much more interesting. of entering is slowing down. So I'm going to go ahead and start. The first question is a warm-up question. It's worth no points at all. It's just to get us into this and to really stir up some controversy.
camera shows on your display if you're on this half of the room because you can't see the timer. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. You know, as as I watched uh, the New Year's Eve celebrations, I was angst-filled at the number of people who thought we were starting a new decade. Mathematically, that's not true. Okay, just so you know, we're really still finishing the second decade of the millennium. Um, we can argue about that later, probably, but at least you all see how this works. So now we're going to get into questions that have actual point values associated with them. Fun little questions to see what you know about Cuesta's enrollment. Pat, somehow you're winning. Your zero was best. That may not actually be Pat, right? But um, So just to make sure you understand how this works, if you're not familiar with Kahoot, each question's worth a thousand points, and the quicker you answer, the more points you get. So if you wait till right at the end of the timer expiring, you're only gonna get a couple points. If you answer right away, you can get a thousand points. Oh, wish us luck. So in which fall semester did Cuesta have the highest enrollment by head count? So there you go, Cuesta's peak enrollment by headcount was in 2009. Uh, it went down a little bit after that, state budget cuts and uh, something with ACCJC I think might have had something to do with it. Moving on, let's see where we're at. They're excellent. I'm also encouraged by that second person. So in the aforementioned headmaster plan, what was our projected growth rate and headcount for the decade between 2016 and 2026? Decline is a possible answer. We were actually projected, our goal was just to grow at 1% per year for each of those 10 years in terms of headcount. Soon you will find out how we actually did, or how we're doing. Our train wreck continues to lead. So, next question. How many graduates from Slow County High Schools who graduated in 2019 attended Cuesta this fall? Doesn't your phone show the answers? I'll stay back here and hold back the curtain. In case you're wondering, 506 was the out-of-area new high school students, 940 is promise students, and the 1105 is the total number. I know, just poor, poor pedagogy, bad question. Train wreck is on it. How much did Cuesta's dual enrollment grow from fall 2014 to fall 2019?
Five seconds. Yes, dual enrollment increased by a factor of 20, 20 times greater in 2019 than it was in 2014. What type of degree was our most awarded in the most recent academic year? Your choices are Associate of Arts, Associate of Arts for Transfer, Associate of Science, or Associate of Science for Transfer. It's tricky, think about it. 10 seconds. Why was it the Associate of Arts? Ah, uh, the liberal arts, the catch-all degree falls under the Associate of Arts. So still awarding more of those by far. All right, well, those are the five questions. We have one more bonus question that'll help us determine our actual winner. It has nothing to do with enrollment. Uh, this is for my friends in athletics, actually. Oh, look at it. But which one's the real one? Which university uses this logo? I know, it looks familiar, doesn't it? They are the Cougars, if that helps. I'm convinced two of them are colleges I made up. <laughs> that is the Washington State University logo. All right, well, moment of truth, huh? There is no prize for this game. relative to those top performers. You can provide feedback, I think, at this point. Do I have to click this button? Maybe I do. There you go. Does Trainwreck want to self-identify? Oh, it's Shannon Hill. While you're providing feedback, you can leave your phones out for a little while. I'm gonna see if I can get back to what we were doing. It's just gonna be an anti-climax from here on, so. All right, so picking up where Dan Troy left off. So in the student-centered funding formula, one of our challenges, as Dan mentioned, is that we have a lower proportion of Pell Grant recipients and other state and federal aid recipients than a lot of other colleges in the state, right? Our, our students are not necessarily as needy as students in the urban areas, the Valley, the Imperial Valley. So that's just a, something we have to overcome through other pieces of the formula. It's not likely that that's going to change in the near future given the demographics of Slow County. But in general, just so you know, those pieces of the formula in which we do better. Associate degrees for transfer. Way to go Team ABT. <laughs> Completion of transfer level math and English, and I'm going to show you more on that towards the end, but we were already doing well in that before our recent gains and completion of nine or more units of CTE, career technical education. So we should be proud of all those things, and I think we actually have a feeling, we know that those are places in which we already do well. 
The places in which we lag behind the state average or the other colleges in the state, completion of credit certificates, but you've already heard about that from Dr. Stearns and Vice President Troy, and the attainment of a regional living wage. Uh, it's slow county, right? So it's just harder for our students upon graduation to reach a, a regional living wage. And that's why it would be great if they would take that in, uh, into account in the formula. Okay, so, but regardless of the funding formula, we need to continue to focus on those traditional aspects of enro enrollment and, you know, rocket science, right? We should recruit students. We should help those students be as successful as possible in as many units as they can comfortably take. And then we should retain those students to a subsequent semester. And somewhere along the way, it would be great if we helped them reach their actual educational goals. <laughs> So that's it, that's enrollment, right? That's all we have to do. Those are the strategies to be successful. But let's dig into some data. Here's a graph that could be the median home price in slow. Actually, I guess we'd have to add two zeros and then it would probably be closer. Um, Cuesta's unduplicated fall headcount from the very beginning all the way up till fall 2019. So it's the, the fall semester total number of students. And you can see that peak that we referenced in the Kahoot quiz. You can see the, the nadir, which was back in 2013, the lowest point um, after that peak, sort of at the height of all the issues. Um, I arrived just after that. <laughs> and then in fall 2019, we reached 12,829 total students. Nice. Just for reference, the, that growth trajectory, we're growing at 5% per year over that five or six year period. Um, a little bit faster than anticipated in the 2016 Educational Master Plan. For those of you that aren't as graphical and don't love um, looking at the data that way, just some summaries. So the headcount has returned to the same levels as fall 2007, two years before the peak. Fall 2019 was the fourth highest of all fall semesters in Cuesta's history. And so what factors do you think have driven that growth in headcount? Turn to your neighbor and whisper to them what you think it is. Prove to them how smart you are. Take a chance, put it out there. And shout out some things that you think may have done it. I heard a lot of promise. Uh, dual enrollment. We'll get to all of those things. Here's the promise. So promise started in fall 2014. You can see back then we were capturing, the green line is our capture rate, and here's the axis over here, such as it is, for our capture rate. And back pre-promise, we were capturing in the mid 20% as far as our local high school graduates. Last year, um, broke through the 40% line. We don't quite have the fall 2019 data because that relies on getting information from the high schools, and sometimes that lags a little bit. But we're over 40% of slow high school graduates now choosing to attend Cuesta in their semester after graduation. The promise certainly has a huge effect on that decision. And in the light green, you can see the proportion of the total students, the total slow high, not just slow high, slow county high school graduates who attend Cuesta. So about 85% of the County high school graduates are coming to Cuesta on the promise at this point. So it's certainly been a contributing factor. So over 40%, 85% promise. And since the start of the promise, our capture rate for those students, I know that's a fun term, right? Capture rate. Um, has increased about 50%. So from the mid 20s to over 40. What about other types of enrollment? I heard some people shouting dual enrollment. We heard about some of the other things that might be affecting our, 
our overall enrollment. Here's a look at our total FTES in the fall. So just the last five years, what I'll point to is the bars are getting taller. So our apportionment, our FTES for fall continues to increase. I highlighted in the legend here, you can see a couple aspects that I pulled out just to pieces that might be of interest to you. So white CMC, there was none actually, that's a graphical error up there, um, in fall 15 and it has grown quite a bit to fall 19. Emeritus is back and sort of clicking along, not necessarily consistent in what it delivers, but we're, we continue to work on that, and Matthew Green and his group deserve a lot of credit for that, and CMC. Um, <laughs> dual enrollment is the band in yellow, and you can see that um, 20x growth factor from actually uh, fall 14 up to fall 19, how much dual enrollment has grown. And then the dark green band is our supervised tutoring, our CS99, all the work that Quay and Sibene are doing in the Student Success Center. <laughs> so I think it's a little hard to see just how much of an impact this is having, but really astute observers of this slide are also looking at this and what's happening to just the light green portion over time. It is actually declining. So if not for these other things, we would be in a decline right now in all likelihood. But just because it's of interest to us, and I really want to emphasize that what I'm going to do, you wouldn't normally do this in a presentation, it's cheating, but I've shown you the total graph first and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut this axis right at 3,000 and just show you the top of those bars so you get a better feel for how much these things are, have grown. So there's the total growth in each of these in the last five years and the, the decline in the light green portion, except that even the light green portion this fall started to tick back up a little bit, which is very encouraging. So the fall FDS has grown steadily. It's at its highest point since fall 2011. Right? We, it went down and then it came back up, so we're, we're back up to that 2011 point in the U part of that curve. The FTS from those special programs, it's hard to find a name to call that group, but you just saw them, so you know what I mean. It's really helped to backfill the declines from some of the other traditional credit offerings, and yet those traditional credit offerings were up slightly in fall 2019. And another point worth mentioning is that a lot of this, those special programs, those students and the FTS from those special programs are outside the SCFF we still get the old full rate for those programs. So students at CMC, the dual enrollment students, and, and those are really good things for us because we don't have to worry about the, the declines in the formula and the pressure from the formula when we continue to work with and serve those students. So okay, more students are attending, but we know now in the formula that's only worth 60% of our funding, FTES. The rest comes from other success metrics. So how is our enrollment translating into success in those metrics? So we have our data relative to AB705 for the fall now. And I showed this at the beginning of fall, and we had just done an early pilot in the spring. And I, I want to put this up so that we can take a moment and really marinate in this and celebrate the work that's been done here. Um, so to, try to orient you to the table if you don't remember it from last time or haven't seen it. Um, here's fall 2018 and fall 2019. For each of these three courses, we have English 201A, uh, English Composition, Math 230 is Math for the Humanities, and Math 247 is Intro to Statistics. So we have the total enrollments, 18, 19, and the growth in bold. So growth in all of those, way more sections. You can ask your colleagues in English and math how many more sections of 201A 
Matthew 30 and Matthew 47 there have been. The changes in success rates. And again, I just want to pause here because one of the fears with AB 705 is when you tell high school students or our incoming students, whether they're recently out of high school or not, you know what, you can go straight into transfer level math if you want. One of the fears was they were all going to say, okay, and head for it regardless of their level of preparation. And that we were going to see a, a real decline in success rates. But your colleagues in math and English have built in a ton of supports, just-in-time supports, additional things built into Canvas, uh, extended hours in the Writing Center, a new stats lab in the Student Success Center, um, support courses, one-unit support courses for students most in need so that they have a, an extra hour with their instructor along with those classes. And look at the increase in success rates for all three of these classes. And so all told, what AB705 was supposed to do was supposed to increase the throughput, the number of students finishing transfer level math and English. And you can see in bold that the number of additional students who have completed transfer level math and English, um, thanks to our work around implementing AB705. And just so you know sort of what impact that might have in the, the student-centered funding formula, Completion of transfer level math and English is worth about, and it could change, is worth about $1,000 a student. So if we look at the 1,000 who completed English, transfer level English, the 800, 900 who completed transfer level math, and there's other transfer level math, so students on a STEM pathway who finished calculus or pre-calculus, we're not even talking about them in this table, but they're up there too. So we put about 1,000 students through transfer level English or math, and hopefully both, during the fall semester. Uh, that's about a million dollars worth in the student-centered funding formula. So that is a huge impact from a lot of work that a lot of people have done. I guess the, the other piece I want to say about this is I want to take a moment to poke holes in, in a myth that, that we carry with us, not just here at Cuesta, but in a lot of places. And that's that, you know, new students, well, you know, transfer level English, comp, and, and statistics, those are really hard classes, and students shouldn't take them both their first fall. I, I would encourage you to rethink that. We've built a ton of support for these students. We continue to use equity money and other funds to build in additional supports. And the more of those students we can get through transfer level English and math their first semester, those are sort of the two main hurdles for a lot of college students. Once they're over those, it's on into their major coursework, other gen ed requirements, and they're on the road to completion. So we're going to hear from Guided Pathways in a little bit. And just think about the importance of getting students through English and math that first semester. And then one other look, we should always be aware of our growth in degrees and certificates. And so, um, Dark green up here are the regular, I guess, associate's degrees, the AAs and um, ASs. The light green bar is the growth in associate degrees for transfer over the last five years. And the yellow bar, the yellow line on the bottom is growth in certificates. So Questnet has not, in recent history, really focused on giving credit certificates, awarding credit certificates putting students on pathways towards credit certificates. But you can see that we've, we've done some work and we started to see some real increases here. But you heard about auto awarding. And you might notice that the 2018, 2019 data for certificates is missing. And that's because it ruins the graph when I put it up. So we actually did the experiment of auto awarding in the spring, in spring 2019. And we did it under that principle of do no harm. We only tried it with students who were already getting an associate's degree. And what we tested was auto awarding a CSU general education certificate. So if you've got an ADT, you've by definition already done CSU gen ed work. And here's that, here's that data point. <laughs> 
over 2,000 certificates. Now, in the SCFF, if you get a certificate and an associate's degree in the same year, only the highest degree award counts. So we're not cheating the system here yet um, by doing this. <laughs> But think what it would look like if we could award a certificate in year one and then the degree in year two or year three. It would be um, substantial, Dan? Yes. Okay. <laughs> substantial is a fair word. Okay. So just to close, you know, we've, we have a number of initiatives that have given us a lot of opportunities to promote our programs in new ways. We have guided pathways. We have work coming up this spring, uh, the faculty are going to do around maps, finishing up the maps for different degrees, and really getting our students when they visit for Cuesta Preview Day, Cougar Welcome Day, to get them on a map to a degree right away. And so that's one piece. We have the strong workforce funding, which continues to be provided to us. And if you've driven around the county, you may have seen some new Cuesta billboards. Those were paid for with strong workforce funds, so thank you for that. And we continue to do phenomenally well in the last couple of years obtaining federal and state grants. And so all sorts of new programs around looking at ways to provide our students with research opportunities, um, just giving our students more support. The Teacher Pathways Grant through the Department of Ed um, phenomenal work being done by a lot of people on those grants. And nevertheless, I would just close by saying, you know, we need to continue to look for opportunities to offer new and emerging programs as student interests change. We don't know what students 10 years from now are going to want from their community college. We have to be ready to listen and we have to be as responsive as possible in providing those programs, those opportunities. So if you glance at your program, you'll see that I'm the one to dismiss you to the break. So I have been authorized to tell you that you have 10 minutes to break, stretch, bathroom, bio, whatever you need to do, refill the water bottle, and we will see you back here in 10 minutes with a Promise Day video. Administrative co-chairs for Guided Pathways, and this is 
Good morning, everybody. Madeline Madero, Dean for Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and the other administrative co-chair for Guided Pathways. Um, I just just a little disclaimer here. What that light is incredibly bright. Um, and I'm okay not being in a spotlight <laughs> if we don't want to have it on. I mean, I think everybody can see me just just fine. So thank you. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Uh, just a disclaimer: we were not asked to be fun or engaging. So <laughs> good luck with this. However, our presentation is short. So. <laughs> Is this, this is hot, okay. So just to start, Ryan and I thought we would uh, just kind of recap a little bit with what is Guided Pathways. And we've included just a short definition of Guided Pathways. And if I were to redo this slide again, I would highlight three different phrases and words um, in the definition. And the first is, uh, it's an institution-wide approach that, uh, it, it uh, supports students from each uh, point of entry. And the third word is attainment. So institution-wide approach, point of entry, and attainment. And that really sums up what Guided Pathways is. So Guided Pathways involves all of us at this institution, at our college. So faculty, staff, administrators, students. And it focuses on supporting and serving our students from the very first point of contact that we have with students through their entire academic career with us until they attain their goal, uh, whether it's a certificate, a degree, transfer, or job attainment. So again, just a little summary of, of what it is. Um, and just something I think it's important for all of us to remember is that we, it involves every single one of us. Okay, so the next slide is why guided pathways. I have some data here, and I'll, I'll preface my remarks uh, by saying, oh, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> that, um, our uh, metrics are, we outperform the state on each of these metrics. That's a good thing. But let's, let's kind of reflect. Here's the first metric that I chose. Less than 6% of Quest students complete 30 plus units in a year. Is that acceptable? Hard to get a degree in two years if you're not completing 30 per year. I'm not trying to make, bring us down, but you know. <laughs> Only 11% of Quest students complete math and English in the first year. I feel like this will see some uh, nice in increases due to AP 705, but currently it's about 11 percent. And that's a milestone that uh, predicts completion. Slightly different number than Dr. Stern's, but I took kind of an average. Um, this is a scorecard, 54, about 54 percent of degree transfer directed students complete within six years. And among ADT, it's Associate Degree for Transfer Completers, the average that I have, and I use not exactly the same number, 86 units. When you think about a, an ADT being 60 units, you're looking at you know, a year or two additional. So to minimize lost opportunity costs for students, to get them into the career they want to, whether that's transferring um, and then going to a career or going right into the workforce. That's what Guided Pathways is about, completion. As far as our students are concerned, um, you know, our students love being in your classes, I'm sure. They are, appreciate the amazing services that they get here at Cuesta College. But ultimately, if you were to ask any one of your students, most of them, I'm sure, would not say that they would like to be here for six years, you know, attaining their, their goal. What our students are really interested in are careers, uh, and a career that provides a comfortable living wage some of our students are even interested maybe in living in San Luis Obispo County. 
So <laughs> guided pathways, uh, one of the key components of it is making the connection between the students' programs and the students' careers and making that connection very early on. So it's about starting with the end in mind and um, really giving students our opportunities to do some career exploration very early on so that they can determine what it is, which program it is that they would like to go into. And, you know, careers are not only in the domain now of career technical education. You know, careers are about all of our programs. So, you know, whether a student is an English major or studying in philosophy or uh, studying in communication studies, they need to be able to see what would be my career outcome in this program just as much as a student who is in nursing or who is in auto technology or, you know, welding. So, again, that is a, a really just a key component for Guided Pathways. Um, and this is one of the things that will also um, help our students save a little bit of time. If they can do this exploration early on, um, their, their pathway will be a little bit better planned, better structured, and um, save them some time. Okay. So speaking of pathways, one of the accomplishments this year, um, we have the program mapper and we have mapped disciplined faculty working in conjunction with um, counseling faculty have mapped more than 132 year uh, degree patterns suggested which is really cool there's some great work done by discipline faculty and counseling to to um, achieve this goal um, we hope to have these maps i mean I'm, don't hold me to this maybe by the end of the semester published um, we're going through the vetting process right now, uh, but it's a really cool tool for students. The, the students we've showed it to have thought it was really uh, beneficial, um, so it's a great accomplishment in my opinion. Another one of our accomplishments this past year has been developing areas of study. So our team, Guided Pathways Implementation Team, and in particular our two faculty co-coordinators, uh, did an incredible amount of work uh, coming up with these. They, um, there are eight areas of study, or proposed areas of study at this time. This is still going through our governance process. But each area of study, the, the idea behind these is that within each area of study, there's a grouping of different programs, and those programs have either similar or some shared coursework or some similar career outcomes. Um, so when a student first comes to us, as opposed to looking at a very long alphabetized list or semi-alphabetized list of majors, they can fo first uh, focus in on a general area of interest and then begin a program within that area of, of study. And what it would allow students to do is still explore, but because of the, the shared coursework or similar coursework within those programs um, in each area of study, uh, there's some flexibility to move around. So the idea behind this is that it will also save some of our, our, or many of our students, some time should they still not be completely sure, because most of our students are, are not completely sure when they first begin with us. But certainly in that first two or even three semesters, there's flexibility, what Heidi would call a flexible first year. Um, for our students. And one thing I'd like to say about the, the uh, proposed areas of study, the names for each of these areas and then the subtitles or the subnames in each of these areas, these really came from our students. Um, Heidi and our Student Engagement Task Force and Lara uh, worked with our students, uh, got feedback from our students and asked them, what makes sense to you? What, what are the titles that really make sense to you? And which programs make sense to you to go in each of these areas? So just lots of student feedback um, here. 
And again, these are proposed. This is still going through our governance process this spring. But again, we hope uh, before the end of this semester that we'll have these in place. Oh, this is me too. So another one of our accomplishments this past year, we've been, it's been a busy year for the, the team, has been uh, student engagement. So we also had a student engagement task force and uh, students this past year have served on the Guided Pathways Implementation Team, the GKIT. Uh, they have provided really valuable insights and feedback through student panels, through focus groups, through surveys. And we've had students participating, volunteering in many of our events, including Promise Day, Connect to Cuesta, Cougar Welcome Days. And we plan to continue this. So really, really important in Guided Pathways is listening to our students, listening to them, you know, what works for them, what's not working, what are their needs, and then incorporating that into all of our planning and implementation. All right, I didn't get to do the fun stuff. A um, couple special shout outs, and I'm gonna go deep in Star Wars right now. <laughs> so these two Jedi have more midichlorians than Baby Yoda. <laughs> you know what that means? It means a force of strong um, All kidding aside, that's not kidding, they, they're, they're amazing. What they've done working with faculty and students to, to bring the GPIT, um, the Guide to Pathways Implementation Team, to where it is now, compared to, I don't know, a year or so ago, it's just amazing, and it couldn't happen without their great work. And so, I'd like the most to stand up, if that's cool. We'll just give it up. And also, so thank the, the great work of the GPIT that's met, met twice a month, right? Yeah, twice a month for the last year, and a very engaged group, including students as well. So. It's, it's, we have done, as a, guide, as a team, the Guided Pathways Implementation Team, and as a college, because there have been other people who have been involved on task, force, task forces who were not on the, on the GPIT, but really, when you consider this, we've only been at this for two semesters. Our work really began in spring 19 and then continued into fall 19. And it's been a tremendous amount of work. Um, so just really, really proud of ev everything that um, we've done. Uh, next steps, there's still a lot more work. So. Um, we will continually work with our students to find ways to engage them, to um, opportunities for them to share their voices. Uh, once we have confirmed and finalized our areas of study, at least for the, the current time, uh, embedding these areas of study into a lot of the work that we've been doing here at the college already for our outreach and orientation events. Uh, again, our Cuesta Preview Day will be in March. And Connect at Cuesta in the fall semester is our orientation for students. We started this last fall already, and it was incredibly successful. So continuing this um, at our Promise Day. Uh, we'd like to create area of study uh, communities, which include faculty and students from those areas of study, uh, working with new students in particular. Um, and then developing opportunities for students to explore careers early on. We have some of this going on already at the college, but we need to expand that because really every new student who comes to our campus should have an opportunity to spend a little bit of time exploring careers and what their interests are before they dive into one of our programs. And finally, here are some ways that you could get involved if you're interested. I would say the, the first uh, bullet is um, something that will be a continual process of updating, creating new maps. Right now we have these program maps that are two-year. We'd like to create three-year maps because a lot of our students do are on that trajectory. Um, you can see the other bullets, participate in area of study workshops, becoming an area of study faculty lead. I believe Roland will be sending out a um, call for that from academic senate, I believe. Um, 
also, uh, he's like, yeah, maybe. Um, attend Guided Pathways talk town halls that we have had two or three, have we had three, maybe four? Um, and finally, let's see, you can email that address. And I think Madeline wanted to talk about this. Yeah, just if you uh, did not pick up one of the Guided Pathways brochures when you first came in, uh, make sure that you get one on your way out. Uh, pretty much all the information that we shared with you um, today is in the brochure, a little bit more here, and all of our contact information is on here as well. So uh, thanks so much for listening, and I hope you all have a really wonderful spring 2020 semester with your students. And Uh, Dr. Mark Sanchez, our Vice President of Student Services. Good morning, Cuesta College. Good morning. Come on, it's the spring semester. I gotta feel some better energy than that. Good morning, Cuesta College. Good morning. Yeah, excellent. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to uh, provide an update to the college community on a very exciting project we've been working on in collaboration with the City University of New York, or the CUNY system, and in particular looking at a, a model, a, a nationwide model program with regards to accelerated study and associate programs. Uh, just really quickly, a little bit about CUNY. CUNY is a blended post-secondary education system, so it does consist of uh, two-year colleges, open access to your colleges as well as uh, universities. So for the intents and purposes of this presentation, we will be looking at the ASAP program offered at their open access community colleges. Um, in April of 2019, Cuesta College was one of four colleges selected in California to participate in this project, um, with Skyline College being the grant lead, um, and our partners including Pasadena City College, and Lake Tahoe Community College. So um, very, very excited to be a part of that work. And um, is Janet here, Janet Shepard? No. No, okay, I, I just wanna, this was a competitive grant process to be a part of this project with CUNY, and I really wanna acknowledge the excellent proposal that Janet Shepard put forth. Um, so, <laughs> This work includes replicating key elements of the CUNY ASAP program, and the design is, is meant to align with guided pathways and our promise work. That's actually why we were selected to be a part of this project. And the outcomes are um, to increase retention, graduation, and certificate completion. So I do want to note that $150,000 for this initial phase, it is initial phase funding, so it's considered startup. Um, it's Innovation Grant Award, so we're hoping that there, there's, we've been told there's additional funding available contingent upon uh, the delivery of outcomes, so, and we hope to meet some of those initial benchmarks, which you'll see shortly. And just as a point of context, the ASAP program is funded by the New York Mayor's Office. This is an annual amount in the amount of $84 million. And in fall 2019, they served 25,000 students. So I was on a conference call with the um, uh, CUNY folks earlier this week preparing for this presentation. And it's really interesting to hear how they speak about this uh, dollar investment. They really see it as an investment on the front end rather than the back end. And so the back end is obviously um, less prepared people in the community for the workforce. So their whole philosophy is really centered around this financial investment on their, in their community on the front end. What is ASAP? ASAP is an equity-focused cohort program really designed to support students through to completion from the point of inquiry to educational goal completion. It basically eliminates all the financial requirements for a student to be enrolled at the college, and so it pays for their enrollment fees, their books, transportation. However, there's a caveat. It does require mandatory participation in counseling, academic counseling, tutoring, and academic follow-up services. In addition, the student signs a contract agreeing to participate in four activities per month um, in order to receive 
those incentives. So it's very highly incentivized. But I think when you'll see that when you see the data in a subsequent slide, you'll see that that um, that approach seems to be working for them. Um, they they focus on the, the use of a, of the summer program in terms of onboarding their new first time freshmen. They they see it as really an opportunity to, particularly for those first time freshmen that are coming in straight out of high school, is really to coach those students on the differences between. Uh, the post sec uh, the, the high, uh, K through 12 system and their post secondary system in terms of expectations. Uh, one of the things in, in the president, uh, the dean of counseling, and I had an opportunity to uh, travel to New York in April of 2019 to actually see their model in action. And one of the things that was really predominant uh, from the student perspective was um, just how much hand holding was important to them as they made that transition from high school to college. And so um, I, I particularly remember one of the students saying, you know, I was um, an A and B student, but you know, I studied about uh, two hours a week in high school. And by the time I got to college, I knew that that instantly changed to about two to three hours per day in terms of the expectations. And so sometimes we think students should know that, but oftentimes it's something that really needs to be coached in our, particularly for first generation low income. Uh, college students. And then non-participation in these program activities res results in the removal of these, um, these, these uh, supports. And so one of the things, and, you know, they're really strategic on how they do that because should they pull transportation, then there's probably a higher likelihood that the student's not going to remain enrolled um, in, in, this, in the program. And so, but hearing from the students, it's amazing how much a Metro pass and a limited ride metro pass in New York means to that student. So the value is about it's about $127 a month for an unlimited ride metro card, but that student uses that for everything, not only just not only getting to class but also getting to work and travel on the weekends. The the metro is really the, the major mode of uh, transportation in New York. So um, they have a lot of reason to want to get that metro card every month, and participation in the activities is critical. This is uh, CUNY ASAP data from fall 2007 to fall 2014, and it's graduation rates, and so for the purposes of this data, it's Associate of Arts degree completion for ASAP program participants at their nine campuses and comparison group students. The comparison group students is students who met all the requirements for entry into the ASAP program, but did not actually receive services. Um, and so at the bottom, you'll see that there's uh, different categories. It's all uh, ASAP participants as well as um, comparison group students. Um, you see development to educational need. I'll see that for now. Um, development, educational need, so that they classify that as students who need one to two levels of of uh, transfer or prep work, and then fully pr proficient or uh, transfer ready. You'll see at the bottom also two-year graduation rates, um, two and a half year graduation rates, and three-year graduation <coughs> rates for ASAP and comparison group students. So you'll see um, for two-year graduation rates, the graduation rates for the ASAP participants is 28.1% compared to 9.5 for their comparison group. Very impressive data. Um, I'm just going to jump for the purposes of time into the three year graduation rates. And so you'll see that their three year graduation rates is 53.4% um, compared to 24.6%. Does anyone have an idea on what our three year graduation rates are? Want to take a guess? Not you, Ryan. I know you know the answer. Yeah. Anyone want to take a guess? It's just, and it's simply a point of comparison for context. Anyone? 28. Someone said 28, very close. It's just under 27% our three-year graduation rate here at Cuesta. So, uh, so the work is impressive. Um, you may notice that the comparison group sample size is very different. Um, I should note that CUNY uh, commissioned the MDRC uh, research group, and I can provide this data to you at any point, to actually use, um, to use sample size to... Um, to uh, really look at the, uh, the research methodology on whether sample size was critical. And so uh, in MDRC's report, they did a two-tailed t-test 
which uh, factored sample size and the results were equally impressive. So this, this concept of um, incentivizing participation, mandating participation, not optional, it, it's showing that the data is pretty impressive in terms of their completion rates. So as a part of our work in the CUNY ASAP grant, um, I want to thank the faculty, staff, and, and administrators who have worked on building a concept for a summer 2020 academy. Um, this will begin in this summer, summer 2020. It's going to consist of three tracks of 35 students. It's, for this first phase implementation, we're simply going to build it for the San Luis Obispo campus. And if once we yield the results, we'll look at scaling up to the North County campus. But it's going to consist of a, a morning college success studies course. We're going to have uh, lunch provided for all of the students so they don't have to leave campus, which will include activities. And in the afternoon, we'll have kinesiology uh, courses. And so everything will be taken care of, care of in this first cohort with regards to enrollment fees, textbooks, transportation, course supplies, and lunch. Um, we are going to use this first cohort for students who go through the PROMISE program, so obviously then that would take care of the enrollment fees. We will have designated academic counselors that will be focused on guidance and follow-up. So what that looks like following the CUNY model for the summer program is if a student misses a class, you have an academic counselor on, with, off, on the phone with them that day asking if everything is okay anything preventing them from being in class that we can provide and really making sure we're, they're, they're getting a personal contact with regards to the significance of being in class every day. Uh, we will also provide funding for uh, university visits and local business tours and that's it's, it's going to be a, a little bit of work that we have to do once we identify the students who agree to participate in the cohort because then it's going to require some uh, collection of major information and then try to contextualize some visits to our local businesses aligned with what those students have identified as majors. So it's not going to be an exact science for this first cohort, but we're going to do the best that we can to contextualize those field trips. And, what, and then the other piece, and I think this is a critical piece, is really try to create an academic or summer camp feel. So you have a college success studies course, which will be a coaching and learning type of model with engagement activities and lunch provided in the afternoon, the kinesiology. So it's really this concept of uh, learning and physical and mental health, which we feel is critical for the student experience, especially as they're transitioning to the environment, a new environment of post-secondary enrollment. And then we'll do a lot of work. We see that the Summer Academy is really a part of an overall experience. So we'll do full onboarding for students, parents, families, relative caregivers, whoever's in that support system of the, of the student. So it's going to be in collaboration with local high schools and high school counselors. Uh, we will be trying to channel those students into a new activity that we're developing, preview day. It's a new event, and you'll hear a lot more about what that looks like uh, soon, but it's really going to be about trying to expose students to the majors and programs we have here at, at Cuesta College. We hope that, uh, that the students and their families will participate in Cougar Welcome Days. How many of you have participated in Cougar Welcome Days and are familiar with the event? Okay, great. Uh, connect with designated academic counselors. And again, really just trying to message the fact that we're really interested in not only the academic preparation of the student, but their physical and mental health. And so that kinesiology portion of the Summer Academy is critical. And this program design meets one of the, the key pillars of guided pathways, and that's really helping students enter a path. So you'll hear a lot more on our summer academy. Um, there's been a lot of dialogue on just the effectiveness of summer bridge programs or summer academies. And so when we look at the CUNY ASAP model, we know that what the differentiator is is well-designed uh, summer academy programs. So, we're hoping through this first phase implementation to implement a very well-designed, high-touch, high-interaction um, experience for students when they come on to Cuesta College. So, thank you. I guess I'm up also in student equity, so if I could ask my colleague to come up, Dr. Jason Curtis. 
I think we may have broken one of the PowerPoint rules on this slide. We put a lot of information on one slide. Um, but it was intentional, and I'll tell you why. I think what this slide does, and please keep in mind, this is simply a snapshot of some of the work that the college has engaged in over the last couple of years with regards to equity. I'm not going to go through each bullet point, but there are some themes that emerge from this work. And one of the things is just the commitment that the college has made in terms of putting faculty, staff, administrators, and students in those spaces and having dialogue and professional development centered around how can we be better. And so that commitment is always the first step in always adjusting our services to create a better experience for when students come on campus, independent of their background, their experiences, uh, the language they speak, their uh, cultural identity, and a whole host of other factors. It also highlights the fact that the college has been intentional in seeking support, uh, financial support, uh, for this work uh, throughout the district. And so um, the work with regards to the Title V, um, I don't know why this is moving on me, sorry. So putting, putting our dollars behind our work, seeking out dollars, the, it's not me, I promise. So the Hispanic Serving Institution Grant, which is a Title V grant, we received in the fall of 2017 for $2.5 million, and that really became... Uh, the impetus for a lot of work that we were doing with regards to our teacher pathways program. And so we know that there's obviously a lot of need for teachers. And so the work that uh, Cuesta College um, committed to doing in that work was critical. Is Brett Clark here or Christina? Brett's right over there. Excellent work in developing that. We also had a team of uh, instructional faculty as well as counseling faculty who attended an equity institute at Skyline College, who's one of our major partners in the CUNY ASAP grant. Uh, the academic senate, uh, statewide academic senate did a presentation on campus with the topic of diversity in hiring this past fall. And a third theme is really our commitment to create spaces where students feel comfortable comfortable both on our campuses as well as online. And so we've done a lot of work with regards to developing resources for our LGBT students, our veteran students, and our Dreamer students. And so, again, a lot of information on one slide, but really just a snapshot of the amazing work that's being done here at the college. And this is just the beginning. And I know it's difficult when you start pointing out individuals, but I think I'd be remiss not to mention the work that uh, Koye and Sibone are doing with regards to <laughs> uh, So, you know, it's, it's one thing to go out and engage with professional development to send a team up or down the state. Often we have to leave the county, go up to the Bay Area or down to LA to, to get professional development. Um, we've been working with Quay, trying to use the equity money to bring professional development here to the campus. The, the travel's expensive, we all know that. But once you engage with professional development, you know, really the next step is not just to say, wow, that was a really inspiring lecture, now I'm going to go back to what I was doing before, is to translate that into activities that are actually affecting our students in positive ways. And so, on this slide, Mark and I have just attempted to list some of the academic activities that are going on that, that we hope are beginning to reduce the disproportionate impact that some of our student groups are feeling. So I already talked about the expansion of supervised tutoring, um, just onboarding activities in, in the student services area, the support for veterans Mark already mentioned. A lot of you may not realize we have a, a Quest to Boost, a, a textbook loan program where we're buying books that students in those groups that are part of Quest to Boost um, can check out that book and bring it back at the end of the semester. 
um, that everything around AB 705, the changes to the course placement that I already mentioned, and um, full credit to math, a group in math who got together and decided they wanted to take on a study of this book, Equity and Grading, and have had a book club going for the past semester. Um, something I'll highlight on the next slide, you know, really thinking about our students and in particular work that our task force on homeless students did around Saturday hours and how that could benefit our, our homeless students or our students facing housing insecurities, food insecurities. And then our participation in the online education initiative as part of a, an equity cohort in particular. So here's just the top half of that that flyer and I don't know how well you can read it you'll see it around campus and hopefully you can use this to increase your awareness but just dates on which we're going to have the libraries open the student success centers and both the slow campus and the north county campus and along with that some saturday counseling hours and you may not realize this but one of the interesting barriers here was that slow RTA on the weekends, the, the bus route comes through campus, but doesn't stop. <laughs> and so just in, the, just in the category of like identifying a barrier, and making a couple phone calls and figuring out what to do, we've now made the arrangements so that students can request a stop, they can call the number, press a button on their phone, and request that the bus stop to pick them up because they're standing at the bus stop. <laughs> but that is important to provide our students, particularly that those vulnerable students with a way to get out here, have a warm place to study, access the computers, whether they're in an online class, a face-to-face -face class, get help in the success center, meet with the tutor, meet with the counselor. These are all huge steps for us, and so we're very proud of that work. And so we've, we've painted a picture of some of the work that's being done here today. I think it's important to now identify where we're going. And so one of the equity efforts we've identified moving forward is a 21-day racial and social justice challenge. I was able to participate in um, the initial phase of that project. And so what it is is it's daily communications that come to you on scenarios and reminders about why equity and social justice are important. And those messages, they come in in the morning, so it's a great way to remind um, us as individuals on the broad scope of student experiences when they arrive on a college campus. And so those messages are encouraging, they're positive, and it's important. Um, it's an important reframe for how we do our work every day. And so um, that will be an initiative that will be rolling out college-wide. Um, in earlier this month, we sent a group of six veteran students to a uh, national veterans conference in Southern California with the intent of really starting to train and prep those veteran leaders on how they can serve as peer mentors for other veteran students. Uh, we will be sending a group of students in February on to the Historically Black Colleges and University Expo in Los Angeles to begin trying to engage some of our African-American students on campus and trying to create safe spaces for them as well. There will be a faculty institute in Avila Beach in March of this year, more details to come. We're also applying for another Hispanic serving institution grant, which will um, really, is really designed to try to increase access for our North County and South County Center. We're working on securing additional funding to fight uh, food, housing, and food, housing and security, as well as mental health support for our students. We're in the, we're, we're close to finalizing an MOU with, our, with Camp Roberts to offer courses on site to um, our active military personnel at the base, as well as uh, some of the surrounding communities um, like San Miguel and potentially San Ardo, even though that's in Hartnell College's service area. It's about 15, it's a, it's a 15 minute drive from San Ardo to Camp Roberts versus about a 35 minute drive to King City for the Hartnell College Center. So um, again, it's just really about trying to increase access to our North County community. And then uh, we've been offering a lot of immigrants rights workshops and we'll continue to do so both at the San Luis Obispo campus as well as North County campus. 
So just to close our, our little equity piece, you'll, you'll notice that we didn't have an invited speaker for, for opening day this semester. We, we talked about what a good approach would be and you know whether we're starting to wear people down, having a, an invited speaker every time does come at, at great expense. As it turns out, equity is an industry in California also. And so to think about you know, what, what capacity have we built here at Cuesta with all this work that we've done? And we heard that people appreciated the heartfelt stories that were shared when Ali Michael was here um, in the fall. And so Mark and I just want to close by each of us offering a, a quick little story about something related to our, our equity journey in the, in the last semester or so. And so I think I want to mention Middle of the fall semester, as we were launching the, the Monarch Centers, Estella Vasquez um, coordinated a Dreamer panel in 5401. It was a, a panel of students, both Cuesta students and Cal Poly students who were Dreamers. And um, just an opportunity for them to share their stories, answer questions. And it was, a, it was a, obviously a hugely moving afternoon. And, for me, as I've already self-confessed, someone who had a lot of privilege early on in life and, and in my educational journey, to hear what these students have had to go through was, it was really genuinely overwhelming. And then Estella, in her, in her own way, those of you who know Estella won't be surprised, sort of turned to me at the end and said, I think they'd like to hear from a vice president. Notice there wasn't a question there. She was, <laughs> handed me the microphone and said, say something inspiring for them. And I thought, what, what can I say for this group of students? My Spanish is terrible. I wouldn't even attempt it. You know? And so all those pressures that go through your mind, like, what am I supposed to say to this group of students? And the first thing was, it, that came to mind was, I should apologize for all the harm we've done to them. You know, the stories they were telling about uh, a bad experience in financial aid or counseling or with an instructor who didn't understand them or, or whatever it was. And then I thought, you know, it, it's better to just own it, to own our failures as they are and say, we hear you, thank you for sharing, and we're committed to trying to do better. And so that's where we are. One of the stories I'd like to share centered around mental health and a particular experience I had with a student uh, just after Thanksgiving this past fall semester. Um, I'm not going to say too much. The student is in, in one of our support programs, but I don't want to conf uh, breach confidentiality. But the student came to my office um, the Monday after Thanksgiving. It was a male student, and he came to me just really in a, in a, in a dark place. He said that his wife, had, over, the, over the Thanksgiving break, had literally packed up all their stuff and left. And um, he, he, by his own words, was at the point of breakdown and didn't know where to go and didn't know what to do. He was receiving treatment from a mental health therapist um, in the community, but at that point, that student needed a safe space to connect on campus. And I've had some interactions with him, not a whole lot, but for whatever reason, he needed me in that moment. And so, um, after Dr. Brian Van Spurt's training this past week, I knew that really all I had to offer that student at that point in that space was um, two ears and my attention. And so um, it, it was an amazing experience because when someone's at their lowest, um, you have a lot of power in terms of how you respond in that situation. I couldn't do anything to fix this situation. Uh, it's not like I was gonna call his wife and ask her to come back home. Couldn't do that. Um, can't, there's just certain scenarios that you just can't fix. And so, um, but I was there for him. I looked him in the eye. I listened. Um, I was late to any other meeting that I needed to be at because at that point, he was my priority. And so, I just wanted to share that because off, I know many of us come across those students on a daily basis. And so, um, it's... Uh, it's tough to deal with because you internalize some of that experience with the student. But if I can offer any advice, I just, if you come across that type of situation, just give them your attention and um, listen. 
And that was my equity experience from fall 2019. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our Executive Director of Advancement and Foundation, Shannon Hill, to talk about the Quest of Promise. students because they were inspired by that panel, all, all, each member of those students sharing their stories and gave a donation to each one of those students. And you just, you don't know where your impact will be. And I would say that be thinking about that because now those students have um, inspired someone to give back to them. And I hope that when you have experiences that you'll be inspired as well, not just of your time, but thinking about what are their needs and how can we help deliver um, more financial resources to our students too, because that is part of what uh, I get to do. Um, I would say that uh, the Quest of Promise 2020, we are really focused on um, access back in the day, and now we're focusing on success. And you've heard a lot today about what people have been doing um, to create successful uh, opportunities for our students, guided pathways, and the community ASAP grant, and all sorts of fabulous things coming down the pipe. Um, but as you can tell by the fact I know all these old numbers, that I've been here a little while now, and I just wanted to share with those who haven't been here a while a little snapshot about the Promise. Um, we announced it in 2013. Our first fall students came in 2014. Um, we had our very first Promise Day, only had 450 students at it, and we were excited about that. We were super excited about those Promise students. I think now it's like pushing 900 students. It's just amazing and phenomenal the growth that we've had. Um, for those who weren't here earlier, we actually launched it as a semester. We didn't know if we could afford a full year. We had no idea. Because an $8 million gift that came in, we were, Rick and Maria and I were playing with numbers. He was like, I'm not sure. I'm like, I'm not sure. We've never done this. We don't know who's going to walk in the door. And we waited to see, and we were able to expand it to that full year. Um, just to share how far ahead of the curve Quest is and how great we are as a college, uh, America's College Promise was launched by uh, President Barack Obama back in 2015 few years after we did, just so you know. Um, and in 2016, I think uh, Dr. Stork and I and uh, Dean Reedstra and a whole bunch of other people at this college got asked to talk about the Quest of Promise at state and national conferences. Um, I learned a lot in, uh, from my colleagues at Ventura how to launch uh, a program like this. The college, uh, the many of you got together, we all, uh, everywhere from IT to student services, every, I mean, like every aspect of this college was touched by this program. And people wanted to know, how did you do it? And I even had the pleasure of going um, to the White House in 2016 to talk about it. It was really a fabulous thing to share across the story with everyone in the state and in the country. And so many of our friends before the state decided to get into this business in 2017, um, they, uh, they, people were looking to those of us who were successfully doing it. And Quest to College has been one of those. Um, we decided that we were going to launch a campaign because what we saw in our Quest of Promise students was we were rocking that access piece. I think uh, uh, Dr. Curtis shared that we were, you know, our numbers, our capture rate numbers are going through the roof. We really are excited about that. Um, but we did, weren't seeing a whole lot of fall to fall um, persistence. We were really like hoping that we could, if we went with the second year, um, that if we just raised a little bit more money, which was $10 million at that time, um, that uh, we could make this happen. And we were determined to make it happen. And we were in the middle of making it happen and had raised $3 million when uh, the Board of Governors um, changed the name of their, uh, the California College Promise Grant from the Board of Governors fee waiver to make things a little bit more confusing. And then the governor uh, decided to also approve a statewide promise for just first time full time students. At Cuesta, our promise is awesome. We had already launched it, it is for part time students, it is for GED students, it is for homeschool students. If you or your family pay taxes in this county, you are considered local, and we don't care how you got your uh, college diploma or GED, we want you here coming at Cuesta. And that is unique from other colleges who are limited by uh, their launch of these state programs. And so we have a more expanded program 
and we have a more accessible program for our students. Uh, happily, but using that, leveraging that funding that we now have from AB19 in the state of California, we were able to uh, bring down that $10 million goal that we had um, for the, uh, the, the second year of promise. And we were able to launch that and announce that back in June of 2018. Now, that's a little late for these uh, students that were coming in the door, uh, but we, you know, we, we can't really um, be blamed for that. A donor of $10 million didn't come up you know, uh, earlier, and uh, we really crunched those fabulous numbers from the governor because the governor's budget didn't come out before June, so we had to wait for all of this to come out and shake out to see if it was actually going to be funded. Um, so we actually launched that, and our first cohort of second-year students those, those students who were here in fall came this past fall. So we, we saw students coming back, and it was really great seeing those students taking advantage of our second year this past fall. Um, and also, coincidentally, in 2019, the governor thought it was a fabulous idea to do the first year, so now we're doing a second year statewide as well. One of our challenges is that we're trying to still find the impacts of that second year. We only have one group here right now to um, look at the fiscal impacts of that. But one of the great things that we have, because we launched a promise back in the day, is that we're, we look seamless to our community. People, um, we have a fabulous uh, outreach team. We have fabulous people who talk about the quest of promise. And it's not like we have to wait and see if um, the, the state is going to fund something or not fund something. We have this promise, and we're going to fit it in perfectly, and we're going to use funding in the right ways to get those students here and get them through. So we're trying, we're re we have a really great history in this program. And it's super unique, and people don't stop and ask me, well, Shannon, why should I support the Quest of Promise when the state's paying for it, which is what happens to my foundation colleagues at other colleges. It's really because we've owned it, and people believe in our promise first, because they know it was here first. Hey, I think you guys saw this slide a little bit ago, because Jason was telling us how fabulous our access has been. Have we really made an impact on access? The answer is yes, we have made an impact on access. And there's the, you know, there's the proof you saw it before, so I'm not going to linger on it. But we've been really successful in that goal of bringing more students, increasing that capture rate, and getting them here to Busta. Our challenge now is, now that they're in the classroom, now that they're here, how are we doing on our success piece? And as you saw earlier, I'm really good at tracking numbers and putting them into Kahoot. And um, I got numbers from our uh, institutional research office, and Ryan Cardinal, I was like, wow, these numbers are not so awesome. And I believe Dr. Stern sunshined them with us uh, at our last opening day. Um, but I want to say, like, when I see these numbers, I'm surprised. But what I'm not surprised by is how intentional we are with how we want our students to succeed. And I just want to share with you, if you don't know the steps that students are supposed to take to get the Promise program or get the Promise scholarship, you can see that three of these things, submit your scholarship application, complete the FAFSA or DREAM Act, and then complete the online orientation are things that we consider to be part of a successful strategy. Or people might remember from Triple S being the last two um, there, as well as you know things we want people, we want students to do. We want them to apply for more aid. We want them to apply for more scholarships. We know that an online orientation process will get them started on the right path. So these are things we built into the structure um, with our help from um, student services input and student input as to how we build this process. For the second year, all of the steps are about success. So students who are coming in, when we built this um, program, we decided, you know what? They should meet the Board of Governors fee waiver or the California College Promise Grant uh, uh, waiver, that was it's called, um, that they need to complete more than 50% of their units or and have a 2.0 GPA or higher. And then we also want them to continue filling out that FAFSA because financial aid wants to give out money as much as I want to give out money. I know that they would like to see that. But one of the things is, is that we're finding that students are not always doing that as much as we would like. So just to share with you guys, um, in fall of 2018, we had uh, 926 students. Just so you know, I don't know if uh, Jason said the, the number earlier, if you caught that earlier, about promise numbers being 940 this fall, so we're still on a positive trajectory. So out of these students, they were the first ones to go to career welcome days, which was great. We have other success measures to go through. They're, um, they're staying engaged, they're getting involved. Um, and we had 61% of them were on a fee waiver. So these are students who are um, economically disadvantaged and we want to get them in the door. Um, and then also notice that they uh, attempted 11.7 units, which means that they're pushing the limit for getting to that full time and we can maybe nudge them a little bit more to get them to that full time status. How did they do? How did they, did they stick around? Well, let's see, only 784 of them stuck around for spring semester. 
And they only took up an average of uh, 8.2 of those units that they took in the fall. Um, they only passed that many of them from that over 11. Um, we had, this is the number that shocked me, 23% of them, almost 24% of them, were on probation and dismissal for fall. That's a lot. I heard a whoa. I thought, I thought the same thing. That's a whoa. Um, 25% uh, completed less than 50% of their attempted units. That's another whoa. Um, on, the, on the positive side, uh, my, our, our anecdotal stories, uh, only four of them, but yay, four of them, completed or completed and transferred on to another school. So those are our overachievers that we don't have to worry about. Um, these are the numbers that I think programs like Guided Pathways, all of the work with the, the CUNY ASAP program, all of the work you all are doing in um, trying to build programs and tutoring, everything that is already happening here is going to help these students and help these numbers move dramatically. Um, I think that this is just kind of our baseline, our first semester, and we just kind of need to see where our baseline is and see this time next year or in a few years or when a committee meeting will be talk, talking about how much we move the needle on these numbers. All right, you ready to see some other numbers, guys? We're going to look at fall 2020. Ready? Whoops. Uh, fall 2020. Uh, so, oh, sorry, fall 2019, my bad. Fall 2019, uh, 402 students. So we started with 926 and we only have 402 that came back on the promise. So um, we had, those were the students who took advantage of the second free year. So be thinking about that. Some more of them are here, as you'll see, but they, that's how many have signed up for the second year promise. Um, you can see that they are, have completed a little over 17 units from their first year, which compared to an average Quest of students, not dual enrollment student, uh, is actually you know, not too bad. Um, Seventy-four percent of them completed the FAFSA by that deadline, so we have a little bit of room to ask those students, hey, you completed it last year, why didn't you complete it this year, maybe drive them towards filling out those forms a little bit more. And then um, 226 students are continuing but not receiving year two. So that means that they stayed there, they came back, but they're for some reason are not on the promise at all. So they're either um, below those levels or one of those uh, percentages that are below the 50 percent or um, below the GPA, but they're here, and we have some good work to do with them to get them uh, back to where they need to be. Or they, they decided, that they and their families have decided they don't want to fill out the fast one, and they're just fine and dandy, because we do have those people in this community, too. So with those uh, 402 students, we're super excited that they're here to take advantage of the promise, but we want to make sure that as we're bringing in newer, our newer cohorts, the ones that are here right now, so on their first year, that next year they'll be ready to roll for take advantage of that second year. Because I and Rick, well, Rick might want money in the bank, but I don't want money in the foundation's bank. I want it in the pockets of these students. So as you can see, if we just have an overall snapshot, we can see that the numbers are going down and down. And um, it's not something that um, we were hoping for our very first cohort, but it is something that we know we can, we're working on and that all of the work that you all are doing is really going to be moving that needle on those numbers and getting those students in through cohort. Super excited about a summer uh, program for these students, uh, some of these students, and I'm super excited about some of the really great work that's happening in financial aid, and, and I'm excited, as you saw, I have too many people in my area. Uh, staffing is huge, and having consistent staffing is huge, and so we're super excited about getting all these students their funding and getting them all the support that they need. Because we want to keep them on track and not let them walk away. We really are wanting to make sure that if we have the money and the funds and the messaging available, we, we got them in the door, we're doing a great piece on that, on that access piece, we really need to be ready and excited for them to come through, go through our pathways, and get out of, get out of Cuesta and making their goals. So thank you guys so much. And I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Stearns for a final So thank you, Jan. Jan and I got to share the very exciting um, and sometimes challenging reality of what we are attempting to really focus our energy and our time toward. And one of the things that we're going to be doing with our Promise students is we recognize that we have missed an opportunity by not treating them as a cohort and having a communications plan to help better support their success. And that's one of the things that we are currently building out because we really want to see the persistence of our Promise students really change. 
So I want to begin our wrap up with a huge thank you to our presenters today. Uh, believe it or not, this is a very busy week for everyone who presented, and I appreciate them taking the time to be so very well prepared. So let, can we have a big round of applause? I appreciate your creativity and, and the fun that we have together every day as we engage in this work. I have to say a huge thank you, and I know they've stepped out of the room, but to Todd and Cindy, who do all of the logistics, who have made sure that we have lunch, and they just do a fantastic job with these big events. So my big thanks to them. And to Clark and Joan for the team in the CPAC. I appreciate their efforts to get us everything we want and more. And um, I'm really thankful that we have the new projector. And did you notice it didn't stop today? Yay. Fantastic. So before I get to the, to the real wrap up, I do want to um, share some news that my phone has been exploding as we've been in this space today because ACCJC just announced their new president. Yes, woo, big news. Um, Dr. Stephanie Droker, who has been serving as the vice president there for, since 2016, has been selected as the new president. And I just want to tell you how thrilled I am with this decision. I've known Stephanie for many years. We worked in the West Hills District together. She actually succeeded me when I exited there. Um, she stepped into the vice president of educational services role. Um, but bigger than that is I trust her leadership. She has been one of the stabilizing forces um, at the commission um, and really has a great uh, vision and understanding and desire to have the accreditation process really be one that drives institutions to recognize their own um, areas for growth and to start to direct the focus that way. And so she has been key on helping us to clean up and align some of our standards. She's done that work. And I just, I know that the relationship I have with her is not going to make our visit easy. Uh, and we're not going to get a free pass. But I fully trust that um, the leadership she's going to bring into this role is going to continue us as a an accredited institution and all of us that are accredited by ACCJC in a way that we can be um, comfortable and trust what is going to happen. That there aren't going to be surprises. It's not going to be a gotcha environment. And it's really going to be about supporting institutions to fully align with the standards. So that is good news and big news. Yay. <laughs> I just want to say, as we head into the start of our spring semester, I want to again voice my deep appreciation for the role that you play at Cuesta College. Whenever I talk to students, and particularly at commencement, um, what students reflect back to me is their appreciation for you. And the stories they tell are inevitably about the people that they've had opportunity to interact with while they were here. What you do matters. What you do changes lives. And I just am so thankful to be here and to be in service with you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doctors Finger and Stakes. And the faculty will stay here, and the rest of us will exit. Thank you very much for a great morning.